Welcome back to Hot Takes and Deep Dives. And I am back once again with King Danny Roberts, who has never been more relevant in his life. I don't know. What does it mean to be relevant? I don't know. I think it depends on your take, right? <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean, I, I held off on asking you to do like a quick little update with me like truly as long as I could and then the more episodes of homecoming that were coming out I was like oh god I really am gonna need like a little update to attach to the front of our our initial episode was literally two years ago I mean at that point if somebody had told you oh yeah you're gonna go back to New Orleans and they're going to reunite not only your cast, but also like New York and L.A. Like, what would you have thought? Right. That's true. Even the idea of them doing this at all was was not even a context. L and listen, the last thing I would have expected when, when we spoke two years ago, which, by the way, is insane that that was two years ago. It feels like it was, I don't know, six months ago. I know. It was literally um, two years ago. The, the, the audio that's going to play after this is from two years ago. And you are just so wonderful and open. So I'm excited for, for like new people to like be able to, to really absorb it. But, and I also up top want to say that you and I remained in touch. Like, it's not like I kind of came out of nowhere. Like you were so sweet ever since we did that interview. I mean, you, I consulted with you before I literally moved to New Orleans for two months because I knew what, I knew how passionate and how much you love New Orleans and continue going back. Like I hit you up and I was like, what neighborhood? You're like the Marini girl, like go Halloween, <laughs> the Marini. Like you really were my New Orleans expert. And by the way, I live vicariously through you the whole time. I, I was, I oftentimes when I saw your, your pictures you posted, I would know exactly or around about exactly where you were. And I was a bit jealous, I gotta say. I met a girl who I still, we still talk all the time. Kate, if you're listening, and I know she is, like we, we just had a debrief on last night's episode. <laughs> all right, let's cut to the chase here because I just want to, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I want to talk specifically about your homecoming experience. So I know that John Murray of Bunim and Murray first sent you an email before he contacted any of the cast to kind of take your temperature on whether you would be willing because they can't do this show without you and they really weren't going to do it with, unless all seven cast members were on board but I know that he reached out to you well ahead of everybody else what was he saying in that email you got the scoop yeah um, girl <laughs> <laughs> You know, yes, it's true for them to choose a cast, um, and we were on the short list. I now know, I didn't know this at the time. It was basically, let's see if if I would entertain the idea first, and if I would, then reach out to the others, um, which is interesting. I didn't realize it this at the time, and, and by the way, this is like March of last year, so it took quite a while for this all to come to agreement. I, by that point, I had already known that they had done the New York one. I didn't actually watch it. I watched one, one episode to get a feeling for what it's like. That's so um, surprising to me because I know in in our in the episode that we are, did two years ago, you say that the New York original Real World is was really the only one that you really watched. I'm shocked to hear you did not watch New York. I I, I know. I I mean. I intend to watch it now once mine is done, but here's the reason why. I, I wanted to see an episode once uh, the idea w was planted in my head, but I didn't want to be biased uh, as to what the experience could only be like. Um, I still wanted to walk into, if, if we ended up doing ours, I wanted to be able to walk into it with an open mind and and not parameters of of how that one was created because just because one one is created a certain way doesn't mean that yours is going to be a similar format um but yes i actually i love the new york season that's the one real world season i've seen end to end and absolutely loved 
so what was in the email? Like, what did John Marie say yeah, to so you? you? You want to get the vibe of the email. It was very short and to the point, to be honest. Um, you know, it was, listen, I, I know, you know, basically you will, you probably have mixed feelings about this, but um, I want to throw the idea out to you first, knowing the history here would you be open to conversations <laughs> so it was left very just crack the door and left very open and then he and i set up a phone call and and talked a few days later it was you know he made his pitch um what was the what was the, what was the what was the pitch the pitch i won't go into the details of it but i will say this the you know a key component of all of us agreeing to do this early on was the compensation um, I don't think most people realize this, but when, when we did our original season, we weren't really compensated for anything. Um, you know, Buna Murray, MTV, they made millions upon millions of dollars off of this. And we made, we got a token $4,000 check that yep. was then taxed. <laughs> Melissa and I talked extensively about the money yes. sitch. It, it's yeah. really, uh, it's, it's disturbing and gross to think back on it now. So we sort of looked at this as, as a bit of restitution for that. There was, so that was a huge component of the early negotiate negotiations. I would say the other half was, uh, that, that went deeper and happened amongst each of us individually, as well as group conversations, but us in production as well was, uh, we were very set on the idea that we were not interested in doing this just to make more reality television. The world does not need more fluff more nonsense nor salacious things that still showed up but from others but but listen uh, most of us especially me julie and uh or sorry Fro Fro that was a freudian slip <laughs> <laughs> oops uh me melissa and kelly had all agreed early on that that was like a deal breaker and non-starter for us and we had deep conversations over and over and over again with the uh, head producers, mm -hmm. directors, um, making very clear that we were not interested in that and that if we felt that way, we would walk right away from it, which you'll see later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, uh, I have a, yeah. Um, yeah. By the time this airs, we, I know what happened. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's sort of irrelevant. Oh. Hmm? <laughs> you've got the scoop babe listen you know more than me <laughs> by the way and you probably you might know this by now but we don't get to see these ahead of time we watch them the same time as you all so we have no idea what an edit's going to look like uh when we sit down to watch it same time as all of you i mean now it's interesting because of streaming i have people messaging me by the next morning mm -hmm. telling me what they saw than when they watched it during the night well I especially was... if people are watching it in australia which is like a full day ahead absolutely which i had no idea was going to be airing internationally simultaneously uh you know in the past the way it worked was it would air in the u.s for a long time before it was then licensed and aired in other places around the world over multiple years such a weird different era now with streaming the way it works. Okay, so that that is totally fair that you guys saw this as restitution for what you all put out there and all of the money that you had generated for Pune and Murray back in the day. I mean, actually, I, this is a question I just thought of now. Did the cast go f favorite? Like, is there a favored nations within the contract? Kind of do the friends, we're all going to be paid equally no it it was very it was made very clear that it was equal and mm. fair even though you and melissa i mean does your back hurt from carrying you and <laughs> melissa from carrying this show uh for four epi for four episodes the one that aired last night by the way danny listen i fired up that text to kate my new orleans girl and i was like <laughs> You need to watch this right now because I my bones are rattling. I I actually enjoyed last night's episode too. It was uh, yeah shocking even to me in some ways, <laughs> which tends to be a theme every one I watch. But every time I watch Melissa, she just blows me away with her thoughtfulness. 
and this is the, the the amazing part every word out of her mouth carries weight and meaning and comedy at the same time and, and and there's so many conversations that you know i wasn't privy to i had no idea like last night there was a conversation she was having with matt which was super thoughtful even though i know how she really feels about the situation mm-hmm. but still mm-hmm. really thoughtful and caring things like that no but you know what that bag one of my my favorite songs erica would do you got to put those bags down <laughs> Lady. <laughs> okay, speaking speaking of Matt, in our original interview, which people are about to hear, you talk about how on first impression, the whole cast thought he was the gay one, as did you. And you were like, oh, wow, this is pretty groundbreaking to have two gay people on the cast. Meanwhile, he's like the devout Catholic. Your body language and the way you look at him on screen is so interesting like what are you thinking that you are not saying (laughs) you're gonna see it's going to be much of what the final episodes center around um and it was my main goal going to do this so Mm. you know I, i don't think any of us mindlessly agreed to just show up and do this either and well i take that back at least one of us just wanted to show up and make some mindless tv but most of us came in being very intentional about what we were there for. A pivotal part of my own life story and my, my personal life is the impact that conservative religious dogma has in relationships in my life, namely with my family. But just being where I'm from, religious religion, their version, their brand of the faith that they decide to follow. Um, and that's exactly the way I look at so much faith is it's different brands. Right? and we we choose the brand that we want so with that in mind that was my goal was to go and speak to that that topic and it just so happens that you know i didn't know this but both julie and matt were previously people deep in dogma um as far as i knew and understood going into this julie was still mormon i had no idea that she had left the church Mm So, you know, I, I, my key intention was to address that topic because I feel, I felt like, uh, in the first filming of our our original series, I, I really let that issue slide. I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I had the language and the understanding of how to genuinely address it without just being dismissive. I just think choosing our brands, we often forget that the, the core tendency of, of, of faith should really be about love and bringing people together. So if your core beliefs are in opposition of that, then you've lost the narrative already from the start. And I think that applies to a lot of humans on this planet. When I left there, I will say I felt, I felt absolutely accomplished in what I set my intention to be for this. And you'll see like the way I frame the conversation is constantly and what and what you're asking is what was I actually thinking? Well, here's what I was truly thinking and what my body language is saying. My body language is saying one, I want to smack you. You're so your your lack of self-awareness is so unreal to say something, you know, to be dismissive of, oh, you you seem angry or you seem upset. Well, Here's what I hear out of your mouth constantly. Are you aware that you say these things? You're so caught in the dogma that you don't even hear yourself. You think you're just so right. But I am not here to make it personal with you because this is not personal. This is about something bigger than both of us. All That's all dovetailing with my first experience with, with Matt and his dogma. So here we are full circle 22 years later having much of these same conversations because he hasn't changed one bit if anything he's doubled down on his belief system so who i just do you, who I, do you think changed the most i mean it, it would it would be julie and by the way saying me saying changing the most does not mean qualitatively <laughs> I, I would have said maybe tokyo i think that's what most anyone would say, at least at this at this point. I think you're going to see the circle back around and question that. I think he's very much, in many ways, a lot of the same person. He just has repackaged it and mm. 
uh, is a little more thoughtful and mature now. He has changed a lot. I think, you know, we all have in, in many ways, um, though at our cores, I think many of us are still exactly the same. But the thing, the thing with him is that I think, I think this entire experience probably traumatized him the most that he maybe still doesn't have the entire self-awareness yet to address it. Um, you know, if you listen to most of us, we'll talk about the work we've done in our lives to move beyond this and all of the other traits and reasons that brought us into this experience to begin with. You know, you end up on the show generally not because you're living just a humdrum normal life without some sort of baggage like you're put you're gonna pull into this because there's some sort of baggage in your life let's be real um and this you know this experience just turns the heat up on whatever that baggage is so it takes a lot of work i think to get to the other side in a healthy way i just i don't know if he has gotten to that point yet he also really keeps a lot to himself he's very self-protective there's only so much you can see he has changed again he has changed a lot and i'll give him amazing credit and i i know why when you watch you see i mean because it's drastic he swung from a really abrasive person um but he but changed honestly, not only his inside but his outside appearance yes all of it all of it yes i think but i think what what you're gonna see by the end though is there's still a lot of the old david inside tokyo cool Cool. that that pops out that pops out <laughs> by by the way you like in our in our initial interview you talk about how you were li like basically you are still best friends with kelly and you have remained best friends with her for the past 20 years why is homecoming not acknowledging that yeah i i think it, i think they make it they make it they are framing it as if you haven't seen kelly in 20 years and like it's like bitch you were on vacation with her as the first quarantine was happening and you had to like rush back to the united states yes. you were literally in europe with her and you're telling me about that in the our first interview we've we've both noticed that too and we both feel that and it's strange because even um in the intro when we filmed my intro that was part of my intro was actually us on a phone conversation catching up all of it was edited out and it does just leave this appearance that uh we hardly know each other or interact which is which is funny because in the original yeah we definitely connected the most um i also had a friendship with melissa too who i actually literally shared a room with they and what's funny about th that scenario was they kind of edited that relationship out with Melissa where this time it feels like they're doing the flip-flop um but part of it is the fact that it, again not to spoil you'll see why <laughs> soon uh Kelly and I in this one unfortunately I feel like we just got limited ability to interact and unfortunately for Kelly because she is so damn thoughtful and careful in what she says and is always aware of her impact on others She's wise enough to know to, when it's time to shut up and let others speak and to listen. And I think that's a lot, even though she's probably the wisest person in that house and the most centered, she also chose to stay quiet through a lot of it. And so there's just not a lot of conversation captured on camera to show that there's a relationship. Any I idea like why she chose to really retreat for the most part? I think, you know, only she can speak to the depths of it but i know just on a, a practical level she you know she's married to to scott wolf mm -hmm. i think she is first and foremost thoughtful of his career and the light that she could, could cast his way in, in any sense um but i also again think she's wise enough to know that this season is, a, is about people that aren't white and straight living a fairly easy life she she's wise enough to know that it's not what it's about. Yeah. Um, filing under the things that they're not sharing with viewers regarding the whole Julie's uh, manager or agent sending out these communications impacting your you and Melissa's financial gain, you know, during those college tours. We're not saying that her manager slash agent. She's like, yeah, I don't know what that person was doing. Why are we not saying that that person was her own mom? Thank you, because I was about to say that. 
I'm glad that you know that. Um, because we were never telling the truth from the start. The game of pretending that we don't know what happened or, or whatever the case is a complete fabrication. Um, and yes, very much. It should have been made very clear. I'm pretty sure. Of course she knew. Uh, she, of course she knew. And, and listen, it, it was likely her and her mom doing this. I think this is a story of what narcissists, this is a deep story of narcissism. And I think you and I talked a lot about narcissism in our first round. I think this is such a classic illustration of pathological narcissism where, you know, the true hinge, what, what people classically think of as narcissism is someone who thinks they're just above it all and they're better than you and they're amazing. It's, it's very centered on looks. That's actually just traits of a broader spectrum. What it's really about is someone who is actually deeply insecure. And the things that they do to build a facade is a protective mechanism against that very soft middle. So this, these are classic behaviors of narcissists, pathological narcissists. They actually are so threatened by others around them that they should celebrate who are friends instead are deeply, darkly driven to take them down. That's the only thing that explains behavior like this. And then classic, another trait of classic narcissism is that you can't admit, you just cannot admit it when your mask is pulled away. When you understand it in that framework, it all makes total sense. Otherwise you're like, this person seems insane. None of this makes any sense. What is going on here? But once you frame it that way, it's like, oh, yeah, this is all classic textbook behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and that's yeah. the crazy thing is, yes, it, when she talks about her agent, it was not her agent. OK, we were all working with different agents, but she was actually working with her mom who was pretending to be someone she was not. And there's something about that when your mom is in on it, too. What's going on there? That the apples don't fall far from the, the it's, tree, right? It's learned, it's learned behavior. <laughs> Absolutely. And either way, if her mom was really involved in not, it's insane if she's not to blame it on your mom. That's another level of pathology. But then also not take credit, not take responsibility. None of it makes any sense. You're, you're literally trying to win a, win a, a debate with an insane person. And you there's... You're never going, it's not going to happen. So, but that is the truth. Finally, the final thing that, that I want to talk to you about is, listen, there is no way that Paul was not contacted months in advance <laughs> of this shooting. Yes, you all had to quarantine. I messaged you about this a few weeks ago. I was like, Danny, you got to get real with me right now. Yeah, the edit is so dumb. <laughs> Here's the situation. I mean, let me like put this into context for people. This was filmed November of 21. Okay. Yeah. This was during the, you know, the pre Omicron outbreak. Right. And we are in the, the, the wave before that, which was Delta, which was ravaging everywhere. <laughs> yes. So you all had to quarantine anybody that comes in and out of the house. That's why sometimes Melissa will be like freaked out when somebody's at the door or it's just so pre-planned. That's why you guys can't be out in the streets of New Orleans. Even the gay bar that you go to, guys, those weren't real New Orleans in the bar. Like everyone had to be tested and... Were those production people or did they like just send out a casting to like, you just, you have to be vaccinated, tested. That was a very fabricated experience. I'm so pumped we're talking about this because these are two key fabricated parts of this show that I want to talk about and get some, some truth out about it, that the actual edit that people watched, people had a lot of feelings about and a, a total misunderstandings. So one, yes, the Paul situation. Let's talk about this. I love that we're talking about this because I haven't really gotten a chance to talk about this um, and, and any of the other media I've done because it wasn't in the right timing, but I feel like it is perfect for you and your show. Listen, the Paul thing, not at all how it went down <laughs> at all. The minute that we, you know, after probably six months of negotiating with Buna and Marie to do this show, we were all terrified to the very last minute. Uh, Melissa and Kelly were the last to sign the contracts, just terrified of what we were signing ourselves up for. You remember from the conversations we had previously, like, 
wouldn't dare think I was going back to do this after the way I felt at that point. Um, thank you, COVID, and the time you gave me for the work that was done. But listen, the last thing I wanted to do was drag Paul back out of the closet, no pun intended, and revisit that whole story because it was just not a happy story. The minute that we agree to do this show, sign our contracts, immediately I get a call and they start pushing for a Paul visit and a Paul connection. And I'm like, absolutely not. Number one, I'm so sick of being Paul's shadow. Like I did the show, but Paul gets talked about as much as me, which is fair because he put himself out there. But it was also a relationship from 15 years ago in my life. And I really don't want to revisit an ex from long ago at this point. Um, I also am sick of being talked about in context of him. It's always like me from this, who was in this relationship with this guy, and this is blah, 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 blah. So done with that. Also, I don't want to drag him back into this. I think it probably traumatized the shit out of him too, and he doesn't need this in his life. One thing people don't know, you know, part of his, his like different look, you, people picked up on it. He's actually really scarred up. He had horrible cancer right in our, our last years together that I took care of him through. Um, he had stage three cancer and uh, had this completely horrendous treatment that went on for like a year. And oh my gosh. Him. What so, kind of so, cancer? It was uh, oral cancer, actually. Um, no cause other than, I, I think, probably being in the military. God knows what you're exposed to. Oh, wow. Anyhow. <laughs> So I didn't want to drag him back into that. We had both been through enough in our lives. Um, mm -hmm. And then we got down there. They were asking me every couple of days, let's talk about Paul, please. We've got to have Paul. This has got to be part oh, of Oh, so story. you didn't you didn't agree? You didn't no, uh, coordinate please. with Paul before you even got there? No, they started Paul, doing no. this in person with you? I, I yeah, I, I, I just, they kept asking. I didn't want any part of it. I was not in touch with Paul. I didn't talk to him but it seemed i thought you told me that they were mentioning paul in those early were they not mentioning paul like earlier on to you like as part of the negotiation to get you to even do like it was part I mean, of the had, package you know, i think they had tested the water like how do you feel about paul but no there was never any agreement that it was okay. that was not part of no because flash forward halfway into product into into filming this I still have the producers and directors messaging me going, what about Paul? So I finally kind of had a panic attack and I realized they're not going to let it go. They're going to do this and surprise me. And I don't, I would hate that. And I would be angry about that. So I made the decision that it was better for me to at least have the control of the situation and agree to it. First talk to Paul and then it happened. So yes, this is like, me agreeing to do this happened a week into filming the damn thing and also i didn't think i still didn't think paul would be foolish enough to come do it however he is also a narcissist and couldn't resist it hence showing up in a ridiculous pimp outfit yeah i like, was gonna say like it's not about like with his physical <laughs> appearance it's more about the wardrobe it's about the mustache i think all of it i think like dave holmes basically said he looked like a like a children's pimp <laughs> like i may be bungling the the analogy but he was very it, funny about it. it 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 was a like a a, a farcical comedy version of a definitely pimp. like a new orleans costume vibe but like what is going on like what did you think of his appearance what makes you think that that's like a good idea knowing the conversation that you're being drawn into what would make you think that's a good idea i don't know what goes on in that man's mind we don't we don't really stay in touch. So yes, you know, I have no idea what went on behind the scenes, but they clearly flew him in days before I was not part of the communications. Uh, he had to come in quarantine mm -hmm. for several days. So and then, you know, I got the message in the middle of the day, hey, by the way, tonight, we're bringing Paul over. So be ready. That's what that okay, that whole text message thing was like, hey, None like we're supposed to believe, hey, I'm in New Orleans. It's like, and, and I asked you over DM, like, where does he even live? He live he lives in Seattle, right? He lives in Seattle where we used to live together in our old house. No, yeah, he had to fly all the way down. He had to like take time off work, come in quarantine. It was a whole deal for us to have like a two hour conversation. And most of it was edited out. Most of it was, you know, 
circular conversation about what happened back in the day, which by the way, part of this was I didn't actually want to talk about what happened in our personal life on television. I didn't think that was a good idea. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the white elephant in the room though. You had you couldn't steer around that part of the conversation without getting to the core. It ended up being a beautiful gift in a way, even though I didn't want it, because it actually did end up being weird closure because it was the first time I had seen him face to face in 15 years. And the, the beauty of it was I just I genuinely didn't feel much at all either way. Um, mm -hmm. I had a moment where I, I got, you know, I was taken back to that time and the hurt. But most of it was just like empathy for both of us. God damn, we went through some crap and it was not our fault. Mm -hmm. um, how adorable and naive to think that we could have survived through that at 23 years old, 24 years old. Mm -hmm. But also, fuck you for what you did. Now, the other the other piece of the story you talked about earlier, which I totally want to bring up, um, is the bar scene. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely not a real bar scene did not happen at all how that was edited. That was a bar that was actually closed because of COVID. It was open for us to have a private party. It, was that parade? It was, I think it was Oz. Oh, it was Oz. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It was one of the two, but I think for it was our, Oz. Uh, New Orleanders. <laughs> yeah. If you want to. Yeah. Uh, and anybody who's been there, you know it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, I think what they did was like, put out something on Facebook or Craigslist or something. Hey, if you want to come to this party and you're a real world fan, come down. But everybody that came had to be cleared and tested. It was a complete setup. There wasn't just an open bar that we stumbled into. We weren't allowed to leave the house. We were in a COVID bubble. So we go in there, we're having a great time. We, we got plastered because it was an open bar. It was like not really open. Um, they were just feeding us drinks. So, and like the truth is is that production was a bit responsible for that too it wasn't just like julie getting blackout drunk um which by the way i don't even think she was that drunk it was a total put on um i mean she was it, like puking in a bucket that's pretty bad yeah that's because she didn't eat dinner because she earlier uh had gotten and there was some some drama and she didn't eat dinner and she went she went and stayed in the room until it was time to go okay. um but I mean, she, yes, she was drunk, but I think it was much more of a put on than what really happened. And this, and when we left that bar, when I talk about and the old David is still sometimes there, at no point was there an adult conversation that was like, hey guys, we all need to leave. Never were mm -hmm. like, the bouncers and producers were not saying, let's leave, it's time to go. Absolutely not. Leave, we're open because of you. We were not asked to leave. That was a total lie. None of that happened. It was that the three straight people were done with a drag bar and ready to go. What was edited out that I'm upset about is what I'm doing. Yes, I am very drunk, but I'm also thanking everyone for coming and showing gratitude, especially to the drag queens who did the whole fucking thing for us. The three straight people are just done, tired of seeing Julie act a fool and walk out. So as I am being very conscientious of thanking all the people for coming and all the sweet things they were saying. These people, it was like real world fans that were there. It's like lots of love in there. I get snatched by David and like shoved and forced down the stairs and out of the bar. And that's, that got let that piece got left in the edit out of context. So it appears that I'm defending Julie, which, by the way, was not defending the crazy woman at all. It was I was talking about me and my experience. I was just angry for being forced out of the bar when no one out of that group thought about the fact that we just walked out of basically a party they were throwing for us in a way and didn't yeah. thank and didn't thank them, didn't say bye or anything. They just walked out. And then, you know, yes, there was reasoning with Julie, but I, I thought that was rude. And I was freaking pissed that I was forcefully forced out of the bar. Um, so that's what really happened. But all of that was edited, completely edited out. So it just looks like it's about Julie being blackout drunk. And, and then we, you know, if you've seen it, you know what happens next, which is not cute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And which, by the way, at the time, I also didn't realize she was blackout drunk either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> upstairs feeling great feeling the love from everybody telling everybody good night i don't know she's out falling on her face on the yeah wall. <laughs> i guess you know i mean i can't thank you enough you know i was so like oh my god he's getting interviewed by the new york times i'm gonna bother this 
poor guy <laughs> like to do this but like I, I truly can't thank you enough like I know uh, I know my listeners want to hear like this, like what, like everything that we just talked about, like this is why they're tuning into this. Um, I guess finally, well, I have two quick final thoughts. Number one, for our uh, New Orleans fans, people who, you know, I'm sure this is going to increase tourism to the city and, you know, it is both of our favorite city. Very quickly, um, I'm going to ask you to like give people advice, the advice that I was asking for, which is where do you recommend people stay? Like if they're getting an Airbnb, like let's talk about New Orleans proper for like a hot yeah. minute. Yeah, let's do because I love the town and I've said this before and I'll say it again. The real star of this show is New Orleans. It's a special city, as you saw. And that was your first time going, right? No, 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 no. I no, you had been before, but you had never been like on a long, short term stay like I'd that. I'd never lived there the way I lived yeah. there, January and February. Um, but I'd been to Jazz Fest in the past. Like I had been maybe like four times, but not like actually living there, the way I living and working there the way I did. Yes, that's right. I do recall that. So you just made me think of kind of some of my first advice. If you've never been, don't let Mardi Gras or Jazz Fest be your first time, <laughs> which is for probably what most people do first. Or, that, or um, it, their, their first time is they're there as part of a bachelorette weekend. Oh my God. You know, we're going to talk about that topic in a minute too. I need to talk about <laughs> it. So, but the other part I of love it you is, so much. I literally wish like you lived with me. Like I could talk to you all day long. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was so jealous. I wanted to be down there with you hanging out. So, also, part of that is don't just let the quarter be your New Orleans experience. Um, yes, the quarter is fun, and you obviously have to have a night or two around the quarter and, and hang out. Um, but as I told you, don't necessarily stay in the quarter. Uh, there's You can stay all across that city now, uh, whether it's an Airbnb or there's so many new hotels everywhere. Like back in the day when we were there, the city was really ran down and... It was kind of like everything was centered on the quarter and it's not so much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, there's tons of cool little new districts all over the place with things happening. Okay, so and, somebody's going there for a long weekend. It's not Mardi Gras. It's not Jazz Fest. It's none of that nonsense. What neighborhoods? We thinking, I mean, I would recommend the Marigny or the Bywater. What do you say? Same thing. <laughs> that's you know i i've stayed in that area myself i love it i love it is it's a little bit of i feel like you get a little bit of everything in the mix over there mm -hmm. and you're still close to the core of the city too. you don't need a car you can you walk. don't need a car you can walk and do everything that's the main reason i love it um and you can do a lot of that's the fun thing about new orleans you can get around there and do a lot without with just walking totally or taking the street car and the other thing everybody has to do in your first time is take the street car Go up through the Garden District, check out the mansions, cost nothing. Mm -hmm. It's gorgeous. Go uptown. Um, I love Magazine Street. There's so much fun stuff all the way down Magazine Street. Uptown is very, very bougie these days. That was a surprise. That's where our house was this time, and which mm. was a bummer. We didn't go, get to go back to the old house, but we stayed in a very different part of the city, which is a bit removed. And What neighborhood? I know uptown, but like what specific part? We're getting in the weeds. Which specific part of up? Like what was your action? Like were you in Carrollton? Right off Audubon, Audubon Park. Okay. Yeah, which was kind of cool because, and that's another part, by the way, you, why you didn't see a lot of the conversations that happened with me and Kelly, we would spend a lot of our time, we would go for early morning walks without cameras and we would get our things out in the morning without without being watched or listened to. So that's a, one reason you didn't say we would walk around Audubon Park every morning. That was amazing. Uh, in like the warehouse district, so many cool things over there now like that did not exist before. And for me to sit here and tell you about hotels and restaurants and things, it can't even begin because there's so much. I think one classic thing that I always tell friends and, and coworkers and things is the carousel bar is pretty cool and special. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, and it's been there for a long time, but it's like a 19th century. I forget the hotel it's in, but it's a 19th century carousel working in a bar. And when you sit and have your drink, you sit on <laughs> the spinning carousel. Literally. And it's fun people watching because you're constantly getting a new view of the room. If people um, want like gym recommendations, I mean, this is so like local news. <laughs> like I can tell you which which hotels you can break into the gym if you need to work out. <laughs> 
Who did no one? <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm you. Know, you're way more local now than me. You know I, way more. I know that you're a fan of going there for Halloween. Talk yes. to me about New Orleans over Halloween. Cause I that made. I was literally just there two weeks ago uh, <laughs> to see Kate, your biggest fan. Hey. <laughs> And now I'm going to go on your Insta and look for her. I need to see Kate. Oh, it's a whole story. We need to catch up off, off, yes, offline. Do. Yeah, it's... Mm. Um, oh, okay. Halloween. Oh, yes. Halloween. Yes, Halloween. I yeah. love going for Halloween. I try to go every two or three years for Halloween. And when I say this, uh, gay men immediately think I mean gay Halloween, which is a whole separate thing. They do. Like What's the, is it different. like, is it literally October 31st or is it like the weekend before? I mean, literally Halloween, Halloween, uh, we all celebrate because it's mostly locals. New Orleans goes all out for costumes. It is amazing freaking costumes and the quarter and, and the Marini and all that area is just packed with locals having fun and being good hearted. What you get with those big festivals like Mardi Gras is people from out of town who are blackout drunk and acting horrible a lot of times. And you don't, that the vibe at Halloween is not like that at all. Um, or, you know, Jazz Fest, which is fun, or, or Mardi Gras, fun, but can be completely overwhelming. Halloween is just local love and it's so much fun, but the costumes are amazing. And it's just fun to walk around and bar hop and drink. And there's, you know, everybody's in the streets. The thing that I forgot that I remember this time that makes the city so damn fun is you can carry your drinks on the street. <laughs> that is that is <laughs> yeah. one of the key things that makes the vibe different on the street there. It's not just people yeah. in bars. The streets are packed with people having fun. And it's just the costumes. And by the way, my goal this year, I'm going for Halloween this year. I think I goal, think that's going to be the next time I go. We should coordinate. Okay, let's do because, and let's talk about this. And maybe your listeners can help us out. I <laughs> want to put together a themed party. Someone wants to host it. Uh, well, you would Kevin be you would be hosting it. No. Well, I will host it, but I want I want somebody to help me do the dirty work because I want to make this happen, and I think I can get at least uh kelly and melissa to come to i think kate can help i think kate our local friend kate i yes, think we need somebody on the ground kate is very on the ground she is in a mardi gras crew she's in crew de vue which is like the best crew oh well that explains your pictures now i get it now <laughs> <laughs> yeah i went to a mardi gras ball i went i mean people are really tuning out now <laughs> they're like what the fuck but yeah i went to a mardi gras ball um because i was able to get in because of her and it was fabulous. There you go. Boom. Okay. So we need a Halloween party. Let's keep plant that seed. Very into this vibe. Okay, Kate. <laughs> Danny Roberts, you said it all. And now I'm going to play everyone our original interview, which we go really deep into everything else that we did not say just now. Listen, it is so my pleasure. I love that you invited me back. Um, I think... I enjoyed actually our conversations the first time, and this is such an incredible bookend to those conversations, such a yeah. different life period. Um, and I and I do, yes, I, I we, like you said, we do have, I feel like, a real relationship outside of this podcast. We have so much in common. I mean, even the, um, you know, your breakup with Paul, you know, I was in a very long relationship and the exact same thing happened to me. Danny right, Roberts, Jeff. I love you. I love you as well. My pleasure. Halloween to be discussed. Yes. TBD. We're, maybe we'll have a third episode. <gasps> oh, my God. We where... could do something live, like on the street. Like, all right, well, let's let's figure this out. This is fun. Let's figure it out first. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Love Talk you so you much. Yeah. Mwah. Bye. <laughs>